So first we'll have an introduction to the reparative archival description working group and the work that they've done from Jessica Tai, RAD Chair and Resident Processing Archivist at the Meineke Library. Hi everybody. Thanks Monica for that introduction. Again, I'm Jessica Tai and I'm the resident processing archivist at Beinecke Library here at Yale. And I'm also chair of the Reparative Archival Description Working Group, also known as RAD at Yale Library. And RAD is charged with creating draft recommendations for reparative archival description work. And we define reparative archival description as the conscious effort to remediate or contextualize potentially problematic or harmful language, which is used in archival description, and to create archival description that is accurate, inclusive, and community-centered. Our task force included members Stephanie Breadbenner, Allison Clemens, Kate Peebles, Karen Spiker, myself, and Tim Thompson. Currently, we have been recharged as a working group and have welcomed Jennifer Coggins, Sandrine Guiren, Yunha Huang, Monica Lehman, Michelle Peralta, Kevin Rep, Hilary Wong, and Camilla Tesler. Next slide, please. For RAD's pilot project, we decided to focus on Japanese American incarceration during World War II, when the United States government incarcerated 120,000 people of Japanese descent, the majority of whom were United States citizens in American concentration camps from 1942 to 1946. This is often euphemistically referred to as internment or evacuation and relocation. We chose this area of focus because of Yale's extensive holdings, which document this subject, in addition to its narrow geographical and chronological focus. We also identified existing preferred terminology guidelines from multiple Japanese American community organizations that made this subject area a good candidate for a pilot project for RAD. So for our pilot project, we were able to work with community groups Densho and the Japanese American Citizens League to advise on the project. We paid each group an honorarium for their time and their expertise. Uh, so both groups advised on how we could integrate community preferred language into our redescription workflows, as well as offering feedback on our local terminology resource, which we created in consultation with them and had originally based on their published guidelines. Our project also entailed developing standardized descriptive notes for finding aids and mark records to be used whenever reparative redescription is completed, as well as in instances when adequate historical context is missing or to contextualize harmful language when it is deemed appropriate to leave in place. We already, we already had a process in place at Yale for saving previous versions of finding aids in a GitHub repository, but part of our work um, for the pilot project entailed developing a process for creating versions of MARC records to be retained in GitHub, uh, as well as creating a 954 field to identify records that have undergone redescription. Therefore, any previous versions of finding aids or catalog records that undergo redescription are accessible to users, which we've also indicated in the processing information and 954 notes. We've also published a style guide, which is included on our LibGuide, which I've linked to um, at the bottom of the slides here. And the guide outlines our methodology and offers guidelines on integrating preferred terminology into existing description. It also includes guidelines on exceptions for the use of non-preferred terminology, as well as the language used in our standardized descriptive notes for materials documenting Japanese American incarceration. And lastly, RAD assessed the Library of Congress subject heading Japanese Americans evacuation and relocation 1942 to 1945 and sought alternatives to this heading that contained non preferred language. We recommended the implementation of a Yale Library local heading Japanese American incarceration forced removal and incarceration 1942 to 1945. 
Um, in June 2021, the Library of Congress heard a proposal to revise their heading to Japanese Americans forced removal and incarceration 1942 to 1945, but the proposal did not exceed, succeed entirely and LC instead updated the heading to Japanese Americans forced removal and internment. Rad has inquired about the rationale for this change and continues to advocate for the use of community preferred terminology in the heading. But in the meantime, we continue to explore options for Im implementing local headings here at Yale. So thank you so much. If you have additional questions about RAD, feel free to reach out. Um, my contact info as well as contact info for all RAD members is listed on LimbGuide. Um, and I'll drop that in the chat as well. Thank you, Jessica. Next, we have Ricky Pusalan. Ricky is an associate professor at the School of Information and Faculty in the Museum Studies Program at the University of Michigan. I'd like to thank the RAD Working Group for inviting me to sit to uh, speak at this uh, forum. I grew up in the Philippines, but I currently uh, work and reside in the state of Michigan. So before I proceed, I would like to uh, give land acknowledgement. The University of Michigan is located on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe people. In 1817, the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Bodiwadami nations made the largest single land transfer to the University of Michigan. This was offered ceremonially as a gift through the Treaty of the Foot of the Rapids so that their children could be educated. Through these words of acknowledgement, their contemporary and ancestral ties to the land and their contributions to the university are renewed and reaffirmed. My goal today is to discuss how I came to understand decolonization and its capacity as a reparative framework for representing and engaging with the sizable Philippine collections at the University of Michigan. What constitutes reparative work in the decolonization of the university's Philippine collections? In answering this question, I wish to present what I learned from the ongoing effort called Reconnect, Recollect, Reparative Connections to Philippine Collections at the University of Michigan, which is a two-year project that I'm co-leading with Dr. Deirdre de la Cruz, Associate Professor of History and Asian Languages and Cultures, and in partnership with librarians, archivists, curators, and collections managers in three university institutions, the University of Michigan's Bentley Historical Library, the Special Collections Research Center, and the Museum of Anthropological Archaeology. I'd like to note that the Philippine collections uh, extend beyond these three partner institutions. Uh, Philippine materials are also kept in the following university institutions, the Stearns Collection of Musical Instruments, the Clark Library, the Clements Library, the Museum of Zoology, the Herbarium, and the Botanical Gardens. Decolonization has become widely used in cultural heritage and academic circles. Many have become critical of the many misappropriations of the term. Critical race, indigenous studies, and education scholars Yves Tuck and Wayne Yang's essay, Decolonization is not a metaphor, for instance, had made me reflect on how decolonization might operate in the settler colonialist context of the United States. For Tuck and Yang, decolonization was about indigenous sovereignty and self-determination. The return of stolen land to native tribes as the scope and scale of decolonial struggle. As such, its use in libraries, archives, and museums, such as decolonize the reading room, decolonize the stacks, decolonize the catalog, to mean incorporating indigenous knowledge and perspectives and revising our catalogs and databases or exhibit labels, in creating a welcoming space, in diversifying the staff or in auditing collections for culturally sensitive or stolen items may not be appropriate use of the term, unless these practices ultimately result in the return of stolen indigenous lands. To some, it sounds like decolonization is yet another word for knowledge appropriation and extractive relations that only benefit institutions in terms of better audience experience, collections management, diversifying staff and visitors, increasing grant funding support, and so on. Thus, the overuse of the term decolonization has impacted its meaning, its attachment to pre-existing frameworks of social justice, though well-meaning, can remove its connection to the realities of indigenous life and settler colonialism. But I am not giving, um, giving up on the term just yet. What I advocate for is a radical reflection and 
reparative free orientation of the management, representation, and use of Philippine indigenous materials, which document diverse knowledge traditions. traditions. Because decolonization can mean many things to many people and without specificity as to its use as a concept, politics, or practice, it threatens to mean little at all. Thus, the challenge for us is to understand decolonization as a meaningful concept as the, uh, in the Philippine historical context and for Filipinos. The issue of decolonizing the Philippine collections at the University of Michigan offers different forms of contexts and considerations. Despite the large accumulation of indigenous materials at the university, we lack culturally appropriate frameworks and policies for navigating access, building community relations, uh, and institution, instituting reparative actions. Though the Philippines shares a common and connected history of colonialism with US indigenous tribes, our in experiences of and receptions to colonialism are not the same. Different cultures respond to col colonialism differently. Thus, protocols and guidelines devoted for Native American collections are not always appropriate and sustainable in the context of Philippine collections. So far, I have not heard of any uh, request to repatriate any, any item held by the university. It might be different if, in uh, case if the Philippine indigenous tribes rely on those archival sources and museum artifacts for use in land claim or to meet some government recognition requirements like the federal recognition process in the US. Philippine materials are also not legally covered by NAGPRA. The law that protects US uh, Native American graves and requires repatriation of Native American human remains and certain cultural and sacred items. This context challenges us to rethink what the university's institutional obligations to the to Philippine objects might be. And this in turn affects what we might consider as constituting reparative actions. So let's go back to my question earlier. What constitutes reparative work in the decolonization of the Philippine of the university's Philippine collections? The focus on reparative work is intentional here because I believe that the sizable volume of Philippine historical, natural, and cultural collections at the university amassed from the late 20th century to the middle of the 20th uh, underscore this institution's role in U.S. colonial expansion. Michigan faculty, students, and alumni went to the Philippines to teach, conduct research, establish business ventures, and participate in colonial administration. At the height of the U.S. colonial era in the Philippines, Michigan men, as they were called, took pride in their dual identities as Michigan alumni and colonial officials. Their presence in the islands resulted in the accumulation of one of the largest Philippine collections in North America. But the harms we associate in these collections are not only limited to the context of their accumulation. In this presentation, I'd like to present two persistent areas of harms associated with these collections. The first is the decades of lack of real and sustainable connections with the Philippine communities here in the US and in the Philippines over the management and representation of these materials. After more than a century, it is time for the university to address its colonial complicity in the formation of these collections by developing decolonial practices so that institutions can provide reciprocal and recipro uh, reparative access um, to collections, reconceptualizing archival and museum work from the perspectives of relationships building where bonds do not exist or repairing when trust has been broken has become a significant theme in archives and museum scholarship. We can build on the more recent efforts in decolonial archives and museology, which foreground indigenous perspectives and community collaboration, consultation, and dialogue to construct a model of relationality and shared stewardship. Although we have uh, seen significant progress in centering indigenous knowledge frameworks for North American tribal collections, such as the adoption of the protocols for Native American materials, Comparable approaches are still missing for North American collections taken from former US colonial territories that are not covered by legal regimes like NAGPRA. We can also take the methodological approach of reparative work that foregrounds community relationships to inspire culturally appropriate uh, curation and scholarly endeavors that address the harmful legacies of colonial collections. We can implement decolonial practice through community consultations rather than apply protocols that are universally defined and enacted for every institution, culture, or community. 
Many current and previous projects have attempted to address the responsibility and care for colonial collections at the level of digital access through the creation of online databases, web access portals, or virtual exhibitions. But digital humanities efforts that rely heavily on the creation of digital infrastructures without appropriate investment in building community relations or input from community members can end up reproducing some of the problems they seek to redress, generating new tools for the same epistemologies. If the goal is to facilitate broader community impact, efforts must therefore begin and end with better relationships between institutions and communities. My understanding of reciprocity is informed by the work of Indigenous education scholars Heather McGregor and Michael Marker, who provide the following characteristics of the concept. First, reciprocity as giving back or involving power flowing back and forth between parties, ensuring that relationships are not extractive. Second, reciprocity as sharing knowledge or a, cycl a cyclical and circulating responsibility to teach what we uh, one has learned passing on knowledge between generations. The third, reciprocity as relational accountability where relationships are characterized by respect and the interest of communities inform all aspects of work. And fourth, reciprocity as circular and continuous, not a system of gifts or uh, counter, counter gifts, um, but as a constant coexistence and kinship. I take, I take this set of characteristics to be the defining goals of archival reciprocity, relationships, practices, and projects that give back and recognizing power dynamics, share knowledge, are held accountable, and are continuous and sustainable. Reciprocity in archives must therefore consider the meaningful outcomes and changes that, resu that result from reparative interventions. The second harm that I uh, see is the harmful description and metadata and the privileging of colonial provenance and glorification of colonial actors in our finding aids and catalogs. We can decenter colonial creators and collectors in finding aids and provide equal attribution to the communities represented by the collection. The racist, outdated, and colonially insensitive terminologies in finding aids and other descriptive materials can be revisited through reparative description. Archivists have made have in recent years focused uh, our attention in reparative description and corrective actions uh, that seek to redress historical inequities and injustices, injustices in the ways uh, language is used in archives and special collections. Collections in Western institutions gathered by virtue of colonization, materials that contain violent images, or those that depict troubling historical events, including outdated, racist, incorrect, inappropriate metadata and description are not only distressing to indigenous community members, but they can also limit wider discoverability, access and meaningful engagement or use. The aim of reparative description to me is to find ways to decenter the colonial provenance of collections to better represent indigenous communities and knowledge, as well as gain better understanding of the full extent of those collections. It is no secret uh, that the university that university collections are often attribute uh, often attribute um, their collect uh, collections to collectors whose career as academics or civil servants were deeply linked with colonization. For example, until recently, the whole collection of Philippine archives, rare books, and manuscripts at the University of Michigan Special Collections Library is attributed to Dean C. Wooster, whose entire career as a colonial administrator was, was to rationalize the US occupation of the Philippines. Through his photographic images and writings, Wooster de depicted Filipinos as savages, unfit for self-governance, and required American tutelage and civilization. We are currently working with the Special Collections Library in developing alternative descriptions that highlight the numerous indigenous communities in this collection. The graduate students who conducted the preliminary survey of Philippine collections at the university has noted that for collections in natural history institutions, such as the Museum of Zoology, the Herbarium and Botanical Gardens, the scientific naming practices in, of, and of themselves are not indicative of harm, but the use of disciplinary nomenclature does not leave room for cultural or historical context. Thus, they leave the significance of these specimens for Filipino communities unaddressed. 
Consequently, scientific nomenclature elides the relationship that local communities have with these specimens. How do we uh, represent Philippine collections at Michigan to better serve Filipino, Filipino American, and Filipinx communities living in Michigan and in the uh, Philippines? To do this, we must uh, address the issue of limited access to Michigan's Philippine collections. In serving existing access infrastructure that have been built, we um, learn that not only the infrastructures are lacking coordination and integration across unit, but community input was actually zero. So I think the first step in decolonizing Philippine uh, collections is to prioritize the slow path of reparative actions to mitigate repair or repair the harm of traditional curation, representation, and scholarship that has largely ignored community voices and perspectives, glorified uh, colonial actors, and almost exclusively centered to academic researchers. In addition, decolonial work requires that we examine curation as a whole, accounting for the whole spectrum of cultural heritage institutions, galleries, libraries, archives, and museums, and not just collections in archives. In engaging uh, Michigan's collections, I learned that Philippine items are dispersed across the multiple units of the university that have been historically siloed. For instance, we cannot decolonize museum objects without paying the same amount of attention to archives and library collections. Decolonization, therefore, demands that we see the discernible connections and relationships between communities, institutions, and collections, and this requires reparative actions. Thank you. Thank you, Ricky. Up next is Jackson Huang. Jackson is the Digital Collections and Content Ingest Coordinator at the University of Michigan. Thank you. Okay. Hello. Um, thanks for uh, starting that out and thanks uh, all the participants for their patience. Um, so to begin, I just wanna start by saying that I am not a practicing archivist. Uh, although that is kind of my training. Um, I'm something of a systems librarian. I work in library IT, but I did come into the field and into this area of the field specifically because of an interest in the potentials and challenges of archival description. Archival description has such a rich reparative potential because of its explanation of and reliance on context. But this is also what makes archival materials so difficult to fit into library-centered information systems and web environments. Translating the care and labor of reparative descriptive efforts is even more difficult. So, so I use the, the framework of translation here to emphasize the semantic impact of materials and description moving between platforms. Platform migration is often thought of as a technical process, but that transformation is also deeply meaningful. I will be discussing the Chinese and California virtual collection as a case study to springboard discussion on the underlying assumptions between archives and web environments examining downstream effects of reparative interventions to make sure that they actually have a meaningful, meaningful impact in practice, and thinking about how to bridge the gap between systems, tool design, and user experiences. Next slide, please. Uh, so the Chinese and California Virtual Collection is a topical collection that was digitized in the late 90s as part of the Library of Congress Ameritech American Memories grants. Uh, like many thematic in early digital collections, its creation uh, was grant funded. It didn't use the language of reparative archival description, but that's how I would describe it. It is aware and explicit about a historical injustice, the erasure and misrepresentation of early Chinese and Chinese American presence and impact in California, and about writing those wrongs through specifically archival means. It contains materials from four different institutions. The Ethnic Studies Library at UC Berkeley and Oroville Chinese Temple provide materials created by the community, while the Bancroft Library and California Historical Society provide largely materials collected by outsiders. The various parts of these collections can be accessed through four different online platforms. Next slide, please. So here's a brief overview of what's available on each platform. Um, I'm gonna focus on two different areas what contextual information is available in each platform and how easily can users find their way back to collection level description. So the collection website hosted by the Bancroft has information about the archival process itself, digitization and description decisions, uh, and just kind of general information about the process overall, while the Online Archive of California, OAC, hosts the finding aid itself with links to the items. The collection is organized thematically with contributing institution 
subseries, and uh, under that there are separate sub subseries for source collections to try to keep materials that were from the same source collection together. Uh, for Calisphere and Calisphere itself breaks down the collection to four separate galleries by contributing institutions. So there's a separate collection for the materials from the Bancroft, from the Ethnic Studies Library, from the Oroville Chinese Temple, and for the California Historical Society, which is probably has to do with the technical organization of uh, how Calisphere works. That kind of centers provenance, allows them to provide additional information about certain contributing partners' information, and allows faceting by institution. It does, however, disperse what is originally a single collection into four separate galleries that can't really be linked to each other. DPLA scrapes Calisphere's item level records only. Next slide, please. And so the second part, aside from uh, what information is contained there, is sort of this question of how easily a user can find their way back to contextualizing information. I think oftentimes in archives, we kind of want or expect the user to access materials in a particular way, usually through a landing page. So you'll see a kind of a collection overview. Um, there might be sensitive content statements. There are other contextualizing information. But in practice, while users do sometimes access it, collections through a collection overview page, they often collection, they often access information increasingly just through other avenues, especially through Google. Perhaps a search for a particular keyword might return an item level record for something within a collection. So there's also the question of from an item level record or from just any particular place where a user might have encountered materials, how easy is it for them to get, get back to any contextualizing information? So what I want to point out here for this particular collection is that um, the Bancroft had a lot of really interesting information on their project site, but that particular website is only linked from one other location within this sort of network of where the different materials are located. Next slide, please. So here's a screenshot of the Bancroft collection. It is very uh, early 2000s, but it's also very explicit about the kind of archival nature of the project and decisions that are made. Like I would mentioned before, there is information like technical digitization specifications, but there's also information that kind of provides additional historical context and names the historical harm of derogatory portrayals and seeks to contextualize those items in the historical record. Next slide, please. Um, what's interesting as well is that there's an, an attempt and an explicitness about being transparent about the archival decision making process for users. So you see here that um, this is a caption or, or a quote that's taken from the Bancroft's website that um, there's kind of both an awareness, but also an a, attempt to make clear to users that thought was given about uh, balancing collection versus item level description. So there's some awareness here that contextual metadata isn't only about having the proper contextual collection level description, but also about placing items within their archival context. So there's kind of an attempt here both to explain and challenge archival logic by balancing thematic organization and what we could think of as original order, right? And that question of whose original order. Um, and so the or collection itself is, like I had mentioned, organized with thematic series, subseries by institution, and then sort of sub subseries by source collections. And for a lot of these collections, uh, there are scope and content notes and subject access points at the source collection level rather than the item level because there's kind of a desire to provide some archival context for the different items within that particular source collection together. Next slide here. Okay, so I wanted to give an example of kind of what this looks like in practice. So on the left, we have a item from the OAC finding aid. Here's an item from the Ethnic Li Studies Library at UC Berkeley, um, you can see that there's really rich source collection level information here so that you get some sense of the, the context of how this record was created, how it sits in its archival bond. And then you can see that little eye there with the ARC ID. Um, that's how you would be able to access the particular item from the finding aid. On the right here, there's an item from DPLA. Um, this is an item from the California Historical Society. It made it through aggregation relatively unscathed. You can see that it still has ample uh, subject access points, locations, things like that. Um, however, you do miss some of the context, right? So originally, this is from a series called San Francisco Chinatown, Outsiders Looking In, which already gives you a lot of context that these are 
outsider perspectives. And this particular, the sub-series that this particular item was taken from, Photos Number 6, Tradesmen, seems kind of innocuous, but when you view it in the context of its wider source collection, which is a collection of Chinatown photos by Arnold Genth, you see that the first sub-series there is called Photos Number 1, Camera Shy Chinese, and it has items with titles such as Fleeing from the Camera, An Unsuspecting Victim, and No Licky, which paints a very different picture, right? That it's very clear that these images were taken without or against the consent of their subjects and actively is fetishizing their distress. And it also kind of provides a sense that this is part of, you know, the historical and archival record that um, they want you to, that it's important, although that these images are troubling, that knowing that it was taken and in this particular way is something that's important. And that's now that we know about it, quite conspicuous absence here in the item record. What's interesting to know as well is that it's quite easy to go from the OAC finding aid to a particular item. You know, you can see that inherited metadata at the upper level, and then you can click on that link and by seeing where that I is, but it's almost impossible to go vice versa. So from a particular item record, it's easy enough to find the finding aid, but the finding aid is really long. So if you export the finding aid from OAC, that's 412 pages as a PDF export. So while you might be able to, you know, go back to the finding aid itself, you can't really find where on the finding aid that particular item was linked. And so you see that although there is kind of a, uh, there's linkage between items and the finding aid that the information that's transferred isn't uh, equal. Next slide, please. So what's interesting as well is noting that the loss of contextual information doesn't affect all materials equally. Institutions that were focused more on providing context faced greater loss of metadata. So institutions that provide insider community knowledge, that is the Ethnic Studies Library and the Oroville Chinese Temple, are the most intentional about offering kind of a corrective to historical erasure. They want to provide both the information, but also information about, you know, the context of that particular record's creation. And what you see here is that because the Ethnic Studies Library made a decision to provide source collection description for all materials that now in item only platforms like DPLA, there's actually no, uh, there's, if there's no um, subject, there's no item level subject or kind of descriptive notes. Similarly with the Oroville Chinese Temple, this was kind of a later edition, a community source where materials were added. And these, the Oroville Chinese Temple is actually a physical building. And so a lot of these items were artifacts and there was customized metadata that was designed to make sure that uh, viewers could kind of get a sense of the, layout of the building itself. Um, and there's kind of a unique custom website along with some customized metadata fields to display the information in that way. Uh, but that the information from that site was never really integrated into the main project site or into the finding aid. And so you can see that even though that material is created that uh, in any kind of aggregate platform that um, the Oroville Chinese temple materials were ingested with minimal metadata. Next slide, please. So a lot of these inequities are likely unintentional effects of technical decisions, but obviously their impact is deeply meaningful. A lot of labor and a lot of care went into the framing and description for this project, and the most contextualizing descriptions were the most severely impacted by these kinds of just over time technical platform changes. When we migrate to a new platform, we oftentimes have a lot of questions for legacy materials around, can we ingest this on a technical level? Um, and I think combined with the fact that a lot of early collections and thematic collections are grant funded in their creation and thus time limited, but aren't necessarily grant funded for their stewardship or um, ongoing maintenance, there are kind of these questions about who's the stakeholder, who's in charge of their maintenance. And it's important that we ask ourselves that how do we make sure that the care and labor of reparative work is successfully translated as we create and migrate into new platforms that we can hardly imagine even now. So last slide, please. Um, okay, so I just kind of want to end on some questions to think about how we recording seems like it. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I just want to leave with some questions on uh, just thinking about how we can bridge the gap between people and systems, how we can make sure that uh, 
the like I said, the labor and care of reparative efforts are uh, translated accurately or just translated well into uh, digital platforms and web environments. So I think the first thing is just really making sure that we understand what the underlying assumptions of a platform are in terms of what it understands kind of how materials to work and how that aligns with the particular materials that we want to ingest. So library and web platforms often affect, expect kind of item level um, rather than collection level metadata, or they kind of expect things to be atomized rather than hierarchical. And so in a case like that, if we were looking at this particular collection, do we make sure that, do we put some additional effort to make sure that item level records are inheriting source collection level subjects and scope and contents? Is there a step in our workflow to make sure that when we are migrating platforms between collections that these questions are being asked? It's also the question of making sure that your changes translate downstream and knowing who to ask about whether or not those translations will happen. So for example, there's a lot of a discussion now about updating subject headings and name authorities, but the question that you know, we have to think, does the indexing that our particular search platforms use weight subject headings versus other free text fields, will that actually affect users' ability to find things? Um, and I think the last thing to really emphasize here is that um, how, how well do our efforts actually are, are they informed by user behavior? And do we have the kinds of relationships that are based on trust to make sure that we know that information? Um, I think that it can be easy to kind of push user needs off to the testing stage at the very end of a project, but that if we really want uh, to have meaningful reparative efforts, this needs to be integrated into project planning from the very beginning rather than a simple kind of cursory community partners check at the end. Um, okay, so that's going to be it for me. I can go ahead and drop a link in the chat for if anyone wants the full gory details of uh, the case study. But otherwise, um, thank you for your time. And I look forward to seeing those of you who might join me in my breakout room. Thank you so much, Jackson. Next, we have Marjorie N. Sly, who is the Director of Special Collections at Temple University Libraries in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Thanks. Uh, I speak to you from the ancestral lands of the Lenni Lenape and acknowledge their continued connections to this space. I'm grateful to Yale for providing this opportunity to discuss issues around reparative description and we'll provide specifically a case study on Temple University's work on reparative descriptive language around disability history and disability rights collections. I speak on behalf of many work colleagues at Temple and colleagues who are collecting in Pennsylvania and across the country as members of the Disability History Archives Consortium. And as you can perhaps tell from the title of my talk, I think on this topic, continues to evolve. Next slide, please. Collecting around disability rights was unnatural for uh, Special Collections Research Center, uh, specifically our Urban Archives, which was founded 54 years ago by Temple's History Department to document the social, economic, political, and physical development of the greater Philadelphia region throughout the 19th, 20th, and now 21st centuries. Um, in addition, because the Federal Institute on Disabilities, which is based here uh, at the Temple's College of Education, uh, we felt we could document their work in the university archives. And we also collect in other areas where we are often documenting the other or the less powerful. Um, next slide. I wanted to provide a little pre prelude. Um, we began looking at language specifically and description generally as a part of a project to create a digital stereotypical images teaching collection. Uh, Black, Jewish, German, women, uh, pejorative content hasn't been hard to find. And the statement we created to appear in the metadata for each image in the content DM record appears on the screen was one of our first attempts to present information around challenging content. Uh, next slide. 
And then um, a series of events came together and SCRC began working on a statement on harmful language in 2017, 2018. There was the Archives for Black Lives Movement in Philadelphia, our work on disability rights collections and also on Jewish collections. I'd like to acknowledge the SCRC archivists who did the hard work conceptualizing and drafting the statement. Katie Rodden, who's active with Archives for Black Lives in Philadelphia, worked to amend and enhance descriptive language and has since co-authored a book chapter in the book Ethical Questions in Name Authority Control. Courtney Smurs, who was processing the Leona Fielkowski papers, which document a mother's work for education rights for her sons with disabilities. And Casey Babcock and Jessica Leiden, who were processing the records of the Jewish Community Relations Council of Greater Philadelphia and adding content from the council's work gathering anti-Jewish material to the stereotypical image collection. I'd also like to express my gratitude to the institutions across the country who have found our work worthwhile and have used our statement uh, to sometimes create their own. Um, next slide. Uh, this is a statement from our harmful language uh, document. In revisiting the statement, I realized that we may need to do some amendment. Occasionally is likely not the right word. Practically speaking, we do a considerable amount of minimal processing and existing folder titles include original terminology uh, and the bio or history and scope and content, content notes often have to as well. Next slide. So for example, uh, we have the Dennis Haggerty papers. The bio note, the scope and content note and folder titles use contemporary language for organizations in which he was involved. We're committed in anything that we ourselves write to use currently accepted language, but we can't necessarily rename historical organizations. Haggerty, a parent of a child with disabilities and an attorney, worked extensively on education rights through organizations such as the Pennsylvania Association for Retarded Citizens, PARC, uh, now renamed the ARC of Pennsylvania and the National Center for Law and the Handicapped. Haggerty participated in landmark cases, serving as special master overseeing the implementation of the Park Consent de Decree and Halderman et al. v. Penhurst State School and Hospital, which closed that terrible institution. He also provided his knowledge of the law and intellectual disabilities to numerous organizations, such as Research for Better Schools, the President's Committee on Metal, Mental Retardation and the National Council on the Definition of Devel Developmental Disabilities. You can see the trajectory of language changing from, if you'll excuse me, retarded to mental retardation to developmental disabilities, but all of those firm, uh, terms are reflected somewhere in the finding aid. Just last week, I was working with a graduate student from the Institute on Disabilities uh, doing keyword searches of series descriptions and folder titles to help them identify topics related to the right to education for people with disabilities. This required using terms from the era and several of those uh, included retarded, for example. And this reminded me that students and other users are much more likely to keyword search rather than use subject headings, and they'll miss content if they don't use the language of the era. They will also, um, as you just heard, likely miss our content warnings. Um, next slide, please. The issue of uh, Library of Congress subject headings is certainly the initially most obvious area of concern, and we um, address it in this part of the statement. Um, I will let you read the full statement at your leisure. Uh, next slide, please. But let me supply an example. Uh, while we were processing the Leona Fialkowski papers, we asked her daughter, Kate, to review the finding aid before we published it. 
She was very helpful on the bio note, but was deeply concerned about terminology and subject headings. In Leona's papers, the usage of the time included terms such as multiply handicapped and severely and profoundly disabled. In the finding aid uh, bio note at Kate's suggestion, we used instead intellectual disabilities and de developmental disabilities. And as I mentioned, Library of Congress subject headings, which are of perennial concern, um, actually included the somewhat acceptable people with mental disabilities. Our plan continues to be to add local headings that reflect current language and understanding while trying to amend or use less offensive LCSH to provide cross-collection searching options for users. Next slide, please. And this brings me to the importance of community partnerships in this work. It can't be underestimated. We've tried to work with the communities in question whenever possible. And we're lucky to have the Institute on Disabilities here at Temple as a partner. It's one of the 67 university centers for excellence in de developmental disabilities, education, research, and service, funded by the Administration on Developmental Disabilities, US Department of Health and Human Services. In 2011, uh, Lisa Sonneborn, along with other IOD staff who were working on a video project to document the history of disability rights in Pennsylvania, reached out to me and we've been partnering on collection development and educational, cultural, and other projects ever since. I particularly want to recognize Lisa, the IOD's Director of Media, Arts, and Culture, for her commitment to this work and the immense creativity that she brings to it. Next slide, please. And I'd like to give you an idea of some of the projects that the IOD has worked on to lift up of the history of the disability rights movement in our region. Um, their Visionary Voices project, uh, which consists of video interviews with many of the leaders in the movement, as well as their children and self-advocates, uh, flesh out the story that's often not particularly well represented in the archives. But I'll note that the interviewees use older, often less acceptable terminology that's certainly considered offensive now. And when we eventually acquire these for the archives, we will need to wrestle with how to describe them adequately. Next slide, please. Lisa and the IOD also have the mission of encouraging the public to look differently at the differently abled. She's applied for several additional grants to present individuals in new ways. And one of the projects is the one described here, here. Uh, we recruited and trained individuals to do oral history interviews with residents at the Salings Grove Center, a state-run residential center for the disabled who are not able to live with their families or in group homes, and also at an Elwyn Day facility, a privately run facility for the disabled. The project captured both the residents' stories in their own language, but also encouraged the interviewers to grow more deeply in their understanding of the residents' lives and the history of their treatment. The content of the oral history interviews and transcripts reflect a range of different language choices. Another, oh, next slide, please. Another IOD project uh, was the creation of a play and the performance of that play based on disability writes history content, and again, historical terminology is used in the script. Um, next slide, please. And I'd like to end with our current project. It's a Pew Center funded uh, history project, bringing parents of children with disabilities, individuals with disabilities, and formal residents of Pennhurst a state hospital for the disabled, which was closed because of its appalling treatment of its residents, to work with resident case files to interpret the history and impact of institutionalization of people with disabilities. Not only are we wrestling with descriptive language, 
we are delving into the residents' files themselves. The original name of the institution is in itself challenging. It's the Eastern Pennsylvania State Institution for the Feeble-Minded and Epileptic. When we exposed just that terminology alone to our, our partners, um, that was stunning to them. Uh, we will also be exposing intake and evaluation forms and descriptions of the residents, all of which reflect the language of time to the participants. And um, who again, as I said, have never had to think about that before. And we'll also need to um, find a way to express these concepts in the concluding exhibit, which is the product of the project. Um, next slide, please. So we're working on how to gradually expose these folks to this terminology and the concepts and to provide content warnings. Um, this may be a blinding flash of the obvious, but ultimately working with community members and users best informs our descriptive practices and ensures that our use of language evolves over time. Uh, tomorrow night, after I return from a day reviewing Pennhurst patient files, which is how the archives, the state archives in Harrisburg describes them, I will attend a webinar sponsored by the Disability History Museum called From Generation to Generation, The Changing Language of Disability and see what I can learn from them. Uh, next slide, please. And I wanted to supply a quick postscript. Uh, I've been inspired by looking to other communities for guidance in the Penhurst project and um, use the Native American protocols guidelines with the team members to get them to think differently about language and approaching other communities. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to your comments and questions. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Allison Clemens. I'm an archivist here at Yale, and I'm going to kick off the lightning talks, um, which are just really brief five minute chats about small projects, and then we'll go to Eileen and Emmanuel. Next slide, please. Thank you. So I'm just going to talk briefly about a project that Yale's Reparative Archival Description Working Group started um, in the spring of 2020 as we were seeking additional remote work. Um, the team right now includes myself, Jennifer Coggins, Michelle Peralta, Karen Spiker, and Jessica Tai, and we've had a lot of support from colleagues, um, particularly our data expert colleagues here at Yale. So what we were doing is we were focusing on agent records and archive space that included misses or miss in the name string. Um, in a lot of these cases, it, it really varied, but in a lot of these cases, um, it was women or people, for example, who were listed as Mrs. John Doe, so Mrs. Husband's last name or spouse's last name. Um, so we wanted to really find full name information for them. We were able to do that for all but nine people and we're in the process now of making um, the updates in our system. So I'll mention that we decided to retain the Mrs. name forms and the Miss name forms as variants displayed on the agent page in our user interface and indexed in search. And um, I have an example there that I could add a link to in the chat. Actually, I'll just do that right now in real time. Okay, so that's there now. Um, so yeah, next slide, please. Thank you. Like I mentioned, we're in the process now of augmenting those agent names with full name information in our archive space production instance. We did it first in test, and now we're sort of like making sure that all, that all looks good. Um, and so hopefully soon all of these agent records will be identified with full accurate name information that reflects their full and accurate identities. Um, after we do that, we're also anticipating adding a general context note to those records after we implement archive space 3.0. Um, because Archive Space 3.0 is allowing for a little bit more description for agent records. So we're going to be adding notes like, for example, Archive Space Agents Reparative Task Force for Women's Names, full name information for this person record was not found in 2021 in cases where we weren't able to find full name information. And we're also going to be sharing out um, resources that we've created in the process of working on this project. So again, I'm just putting a link to this in the chat. 
Um, that's the resources page that I just sort of spun up in preparation for this, um, this forum. And I just want to mention, again, the gratitude to our data expert colleagues here at Yale and the folks that we consulted with externally, including um, archivists and librarians at the National Library of Medicine, Columbia University Rare Book and Manuscript Library, Purdue University, New York University, and University of Tennessee. So I think there have been sort of similar projects that have um, really served as inspiration for us. So yeah, if you're interested in this project or le learning more about it, please do feel free to get in touch. And I've included my, um, my contact information there. So that was very, very brief, but I'll go ahead and hand things over to Emmanuel. Or, I'm sorry, is Eileen next? Um, to Eileen next. Thank you, Allison. Hi, I'm Eileen DeWittia. I'm the head of bibliographic cataloging from the Wilson Special Collections Library here at UNC Chapel Hill. And I thought I would talk about our experience with building an infrastructure around ethical description. Next slide. Thank you. Special Collections Tech Services began this work in earnest in 2017 to remediate legacy description. We worked closely with our public services colleagues who were teaching with these finding aids and searching across the catalog for materials that were triggering to our staff and researchers. Prior to the pandemic, we were addressing this work in addition to cataloging and processing. However, working from home has allowed us time to analyze and evaluate the elements of description in conjunction with the standards we follow. While we were having difficult conversations and exploring resources to assist us in this journey, our university librarian issued a reckoning initiative to further empower us, educate us, and guide us in this work. Next slide, please. Library leadership and staff are unified in their commitment to this work. Our goal is to make sure that we are a trusted resource to maintain an integrity of knowledge and we need to act by making our description inclusive and accessible to all, especially those who are represented in our collections, as well as those trying to learn more about these communities. This shared framework unites and focuses us to a common goal. It is empowering us to think outside the box with grants to support and further this work. We are building the plane as we fly and are developing workflows, processes, and policies that are available across our library system. Next slide, please. The work is complex, emotional, and spread out so that it touches upon numerous departments in the libraries, technical services, public services, curatorial, subject liaisons, metadata, digital repository, IT, and more. With so many of us involved in different layers and at different stages of ethical description across the libraries, we are unified in our resolve to do the work, but staying together has been especially challenging. Making use of skill sets, expertise, and connections to professional associations and committees is essential to our success. But reporting back and sharing these connections is not always easy. People across the organization are in different spaces on this journey. So that has provided another level of complexity as we come together and approach this work. Next slide, please. As chair of the Ethical Description Working Group for Bibliographic Materials, I find that try, tying the work from my department to the work of the digital repository and our tech services counterparts in the main library takes much communication from our initial steps and a shared understanding of the workflows and policies to ensure consistency in application and outcomes. It seems that we are attending numerous meetings to remain in step, discuss the work, document decisions, and iterate as we go along. Not only are we working across the university libraries, but we are working within a consortia and a shared catalog, which necessitates thoughtfulness, planning, and a shared understanding of inclusion, equity, accessibility, and diversity as it relates to description and identity. This is just one example, but you can see here how many groups we have addressing this work. Next slide, please. Ethical Description Working Group has illuminated issues with who makes decisions and how to do so transparently. We all agree that engaging with those communities represented in our collections is the best course of action to assist in our decision-making processes. But this is not always straightforward or easy to do. We do not have a history of including this piece in our work routines. As we do the work, we are developing new workflows, initiating new pilot projects, creating and editing subject headings and snack records, and evaluating how we apply descriptive fields, which necessitates making concerted efforts in communicating and slowing down to ensure that we are together. Everyone is engaged in this work, 
and we are putting in a great deal of energy to coordinate efforts and to clearly define the roles and responsibilities of the work to be done. Understanding that this work needs to be prioritized, we need to examine how we can balance this with our existing streams of new acquisitions, gifts, and backlogs. Our resources of time and staff remain constant, and it is tough to keep up as collections continue to grow. Next slide, please. Ethical description is emotionally charged and is difficult to coordinate as we work to fulfill our goals of educating, enlightening, and enriching our library communities. We've been at this a relatively short amount of time and have made strides toward more inclusive and accessible description, but we have farther to go. We are creating an infrastructure for this work and continue to evolve as we improve our understanding of what is involved and necessary. Most importantly in this endeavor is that we are working together and learning from one another. Thank you. Now to Emmanuel. So I'm the collections data manager at the Yale Center for British Art, and today I look at the museum's critical cataloging in relation. It went out again. Hmm. How strange. I can hear you now. Okay. So okay. let's go. Let's go to the second slide, please. So the Yale. Center for British Art is a museum that houses the largest collection of British art outside of the UK. The collections span the 16th century to the present and are international in scope. With actually many works uh, relating to the former British Empire, the sub subcontinent, the Caribbean, and the African diaspora. So I'll introduce uh, the museum's critical cataloging efforts focusing on the online collections catalog. And our work relates to the Yale White Cross collection platform called Lux, uh, to which the museum is contributing all of its holdings descriptions alongside the Yale University Library System and the two other uh, museums at Yale. So I'll focus on critical cataloging at, of the art collection at the, uh, at the museum. Our approach is coordinated with the other YCBA collections, which include not only works of art, but also rare books and manuscripts, archives and reference library material. The YCBA's holdings across these collections are cataloged in different systems, which makes our work a little bit more complicated, but our goal is to approach all of our collections with the same intentional approach to cataloging in order to offer a consistent online experience. Next slide, please. Due to the nature of the cross collection platform Lux, um, it, so Lux has put a spotlight on the presence of systemic bias, oppression, and cultural appropriation that's embedded in our collections data. To address this then, Yale established a cultural heritage bias awareness and responsibility committee which has developed a value statement that you can read here, as well as a series of recommendations to address implicit and explicit bias with our knowledge systems. Next slide, please. So two key principles guide our ongoing re-evaluation of our cataloging practices at the museum. Firstly, the museum's engagement with visitors. We are committed to creating respectful and inclusive descriptions of, um, of our collections so that visitors to the museum's physical and online spaces can have a meaningful experience. At the same time, we're keenly aware of the need to bear witness to and confront the history of our collections. As a critical historian of its own collections, the museum needs to welcome opportunities to change for change. And therefore, um, we aim to be be transparent about what's been accomplished and what remains to be done. Our methodology is to be as transparent as possible with historical information. Not only does this mean we do not withhold or hide content, but it also means we proactively publish it and we put it in the context of our present day interpretations. Thus, we're not filtering out any images or historical content. Rather, we endeavor to share with the audiences nuanced research on the histories of the YCBA collections. 
And one of the um, bias awareness and uh, responsibility committee recommendations is contextualization, and this has become a priority at the YCBA. Um, next slide, please. So I'll, I'll now show you work in progress on um, our online catalog, which shows how we are applying these principles. So you can clearly see uh, that this painting has been known by many title, many titles over its lifetime, and museums in general change the titles of works of art frequently. Um, in, recent, in recent years, in particular, titles have been changed to update or remove offensive language. However, we at, at the center, at the museum, we want to make sure that the history of the title is not obscured, and therefore we adopted a new approach to systematically research the historical titles and share them online, allowing visitors to trace where the titles came from and when they were in use. And we've, we've yet to figure out exactly how Lux might display or use this information, but we're working on it. Um, next slide, please. Another step we've taken uh, is to publish past and current gallery labels or, and other museum assets. And we've begun to add the date and purpose of this text to add further context. And here you see three, I know you can't read them, but three labels for that one object from three different years, that in 2005, I think. Next slide, please. We're also re-evaluating the metadata of our records, such as subject terms and replacing them when they are outmoded, offensive, or discriminatory. For example, while well, we plan to keep colonial place names when they appear in historical titles, as in this work, um, we will provide the modern variants of these names as subject terms. And see, so here we're looking at um, Calcutta versus Kolkata in the subject terms. LOX has a, actually a very sophisticated data reconciliation process, which will match our subject terms with that of other LOX contributors, as well as um, data coming from external authorities, such as the Getty Vocabularies or LCSH. Next slide, please. So many of these components come into play in the description of the museum's Ilahu Yale group portrait that you see here, lower left. Our Critical cataloging approach has allowed us to give it a new title and a new subject term. Both of these changes acknowledge the presence of the boy and his humanity. Um, the museum published extensive research on this painting in a scholarly essay, which links to the catalog record. And the visibility of this groundbreaking research was a critical element during the recent conference organized by the Yale Center for the study of slavery, resistance, and abolition. And it's really a timely reminder that offering historical context is essential to make sense of the world around us. Thank you.